we often describe it as though it's as a service on demand um and and to me this is one of the kind of most exciting and and growing areas of technology moving from that kind of pure tech solution to how you can use technology to facilitate uh, the service industry we see ourselves as part of that kind of technology advancement on the podcast today, we welcome Pip Wilson, the co-founder and CEO of Amicable, to talk all about divorce. This is Tech Talks, your twice-weekly technology podcast featuring interviews with some of the industry's leading figures, as well as a bit of technology news. Today, I am joined by Jack Pierce, my erstwhile co-host. How are you? Hello. Never been described as erstwhile before. Like it. That might have been the wrong use of the word. <laughs> no idea. We'll go with it. I might be overstretching there. Um, Jack, uh, have you seen Marriage Story? Um, I haven't, um, unfortunately. Oh, you're, you're a big Adam Driver fan as well. Huge Adam Driver fan, yeah. And I haven't seen that or Patterson, which are meant to be his two best films. So I can't really dub myself as that huge of a fan, I guess. Oh, um... Black Black Klansman is a good film. Oh, that's superb. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, he's excellent in that. Yep. Anyway, in Murray's story, he's also superb. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a good recommendation for a watch if you're looking for something uh, a little bit more serious and drama-focused in lockdown times. Um, how is it not, watching it, easy watch. How is it watching it with your partner you're very much in love with during you know heightened situations amongst uh, eight, week eight of lockdown now? How would you, how would you you know <laughs> are you going to be like oh shit I see that in my partner is it is it going to bring up more issues is what I'm trying to say? No, no. Because no, okay. at the beginning of the film, the relationship is already screwed, right? Um, uh, and it's 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 all about the falling apart okay. of so very pertinent to today's interview well, in yes. terms of you know they they start off trying to be on good terms and that unravels quite rapidly um and it is quite poignant because whilst it's a drama um and there are many well-known actors in it it is it is based on the true experiences of the writer and director nice and it- who is the writer and director? Oh, don't ask. I should know that. Uh, I'll have to look it up. I could pause and edit and make it make it look like I know what I'm on about, but I don't. We don't want to lose uh, authenticity, right. Dave. Nah, nah, not so much. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a really good watch. It's 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 quite it's quite moving. It's 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 a tough watch in places. I will say I don't really understand why Laura Dern won the Oscar. No, no, nothing against Laura Dern, but there are better people in that film. Um, so see. that was a bit of an odd one. Um, but hey ho, that aside, great film. Give it a watch, and it's a lovely segue into today's interview. <laughs> today we are joined by Pip Wilson. She is the co-founder and CEO of Amicable. How are you today? Uh, yeah, considering current circumstances, I'm I'm pretty good actually. Thank you. I look. I I don't want to be glib about this, but given that you are um, a service, a kind of a groundbreaking, innovative service for divorce and separation of couples having a whole load of people shoved in the same house 24-7 when they're not used to it is kind of an opportunity, right? <laughs> I probably shouldn't joke about that. Uh, it's, it's really difficult, Dave, and this is something that we've obviously kind of I've touched on, but it's so early days. I mean, we're, we're recording this on, on March the 23rd, and at the moment it, it, people are still coming to terms with what is effectively a kind of a total change in how life is working. And you're right, some people are being faced with um, put in the same house with somebody who they might not be getting on particularly well. <laughs> and, and it could be make and break on, on quite a lot of relationships. Um, but what what we're finding at the moment is that actually people need a bit of time to kind of make yeah. decisions on stuff and it is probably very early days whilst i am kind of being slightly facetious about the situation that people find themselves in i uh, probably shouldn't joke about it but um let's put some context around amicable and what 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 you are doing with your co-founders Absolutely. So um, we uh, started Amicable about f- uh, four years ago now, um, mm-hmm. mainly off the back of uh, Kate Daly, who's my co-founder's very difficult, very traumatic divorce, where she came out of the other side and thought, hold on a minute, it- it's nothing that we did wrong, but actually the the system, the kind of process that you have to go through uh, mm-hmm. that really made this 
so difficult mm. and actually could is there things that could be done about the process to make this not not a nice experience for people because it's always going to be difficult but to make it a better experience for for people going through it um and so she retrained as a family consultant and started helping other couples to get through um, the experience of divorce and separation in a better way and in particularly to kind of make that transition from parents to co-parents as um a change in relationship rather than a all out war. <laughs> and that was that was kind of the real premise. Now we've known each other for a long time. We were actually friends because our um we had our eldest kids at the same time. Uh, I saw her going through her divorce and my background is much more business and technology. And I'd um I'd actually just um exited my previous startup and um for for some reason that i i sometimes uh, wonder why I thought i know i'll start another one <laughs> and we'd spent quite a lot of time talking um and came to the conclusion that actually it was the combination of business and technology with what she was doing that could really make this su- successful and scale it and and hopefully help a lot of people as well as kind of running a successful business yeah, do you mind me asking what how tech does help you scale it? Because beyond it being online, you know, you've got a .io website, um, and I can, I suppose there's an element that you still have to physically then go and talk to a lawyer or a consult. I, I guess no. I, I know very little about this area, thankfully. <laughs> Hopefully that stays that way. But uh, I, I guess I I would assume that there's there's certain aspects of it that are quite difficult to innovate or change, and I might be entirely wrong there. Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest, Dave, you don't have to talk to a lawyer at all. And one of the things that we um, have been kind of very clear out and customers have have absolutely said that they like about our service is that you can do the whole thing end to end through us so we not only help people with negotiations but we also write all the legal documents and we therefore give you that kind of single point of contact um, and you don't have to go to a lawyer's office you don't have to kind of buy services by the hour in the way that people perceived that you always needed to um Mm -hmm. so it is offering a very different solution um uh, we often describe it as though as as a service on demand um and and to me this is one of the kind of most exciting and and growing areas of technology in the it moving from that kind of pure tech solution to how you can use technology to facilitate uh, the service industry and I, I can't help but think that the um, what's going on in the world now will only accelerate that further so mm. the ability to be able to speak to doctors over kind of a, a 15 minute call that you've booked rather than have to book an appointment to your local GP or to get online um, uh, counselling or other forms of kind of advice service uh, has started to exist in the last year or so, but it's fairly new. Uh, but absolutely feels like the way things are going, uh, and we are we see ourselves as part of that kind of technology advancement. So, I don't know whether you've seen Marriage Story or not. I have seen Marriage Story. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a brilliant film, and I suppose it is. It would be a wonderful advert for something like Amicable because it looks like a horrendous experience. Uh, and and obviously is based on the writer's own experiences of going through divorce and getting to a co-parenting place. Um, I suppose looking at that, there are some obvious friction points. When you've got when you've got a tech startup, it tends to be looking at the friction points that tech can kind of augment or help slightly. When you were looking at it as a, as an end to end service, what were the points, the key points, where you thought, you know, what this is where we could really help? Yeah, so I think the, the the key points from us are firstly the ability to do it as a couple, and that's and I'll come more on to how tech helps in that because that's more a kind of philosophical um, the psychology of how we do things. Um, so th- if you look at Mary's story, where they started off, where they first split, they were actually on reasonably good terms and they thought they could work Mm. out and it was only when they started to effectively outsource communication and get lawyers communicating to each other that they got further apart um so our view is that we work with couples and 
if you have a couple and um, you are both then able to keep some level of communication with our facilitation, then your chances of reaching an outcome and being able to move on with your life that you're both happy with are, are greater. Uh, and especially if you've got kids, the the opportunity to be able to continue to communicate effectively about the kids, again, remains greater. Um, so that working with couples is kind of a key thing that we do. Um, where we use tech is to actually make the process feel less onerous for people. So the legal, um, the legal language and the documentation used and all these kind of things make, make it feel difficult. They make it difficult to navigate. And so from basic things like on our website, you can download a timeline. So you get a view as to what divorce looks like, what the process mm. will look like, and that's personalized to you. We get hundreds of requests for that a week because people just don't understand it. Um, and it's not explained very clearly, et cetera, anywhere else. Um, all of our meetings are virtual meetings. So it's less time off work. You can be in a different place from your the person that you are negotiating with, which is surprisingly useful to be kind of on the same on the same call, but not actually in the same room. Uh, works really well, uh, and uh, as we can now see, everyone's at, uh, everyone's um, ability to be able to do things over video conferencing is going to go to a whole new level as the world moves forwards. Um, so we think it's increasingly re- relevant. Um, And then I think the final thing that we're kind of doing now, although there's more in the pipeline, is we use some very straightforward kind of chatbot AI to answer basic questions up front Mm -hmm. and direct people in the right way. So to give some information and then book a call with somebody if they need to actually speak to a person. Just out of interest, being a firm that's two female co-founders tackling something that's quite a traditional subject that um, involves lawyers normally in courts and areas that are quite typically dominated by men. Um, Has that consciously or subconsciously altered the way that you've built the service to make it more friendly maybe to to women going through this process? Um, We try very hard to not to make it neutral because that's a right. really key point. We we cannot take sides and we have to be a neutral service because we're trying to find the best outcome for a family, not for an individual. Um, mm-hmm. And it's interesting because because we are a technology brand, we tend to appeal to men from that perspective, although we right. are a, we happen to have two female <laughs> co-founders. Um, it, and we find that actually, I mean, last time we measured it, our, our kind of leads, our, our new potential customers were almost 50-50 split between male and female. Um, and that's great. And if we felt the balance was skewing far too far one way, we would actually be genuinely worried we were going in the wrong direction. This has to be a neutral service and appeal to to couples as a whole. Um um, and one of the things we're looking at quite actively is how we increase our, our number of male divorce coaches so we can have kind of that uh, that being a bit more even as well. Now, I suppose the business, was it founded or launched in 2016? Make sure I get this right. Uh, yeah, we founded actually towards the end of 2015, but mm-hmm. at, at quite a slow start intentionally. Um, firstly, because we were both kind of finishing what we'd been working on previously. Um, and also because it's it's not a quick thing to test. <laughs> the, the divorce process is slow. And originally we started building, actually we started from a technology first approach. So we built an app to help people making arrangements, mm-hmm. which is a free app, which is still live. Um, and we then um, got feedback from customers on that. But we purposefully did that quite slowly because we had to talk to different people going through different stages in the process. And it's often a six month to a one year process. So go on. Yeah. I was just going to say, just out of interest around the consideration of how you, because obviously I can see that you do want to scale and it makes perfect sense. But at the same time, you know, you look at the language that that's on your website, you know, you're in safe hands. Um, you've got a team of experts. Um, uh, our services simplify the process, help you build um, a future, a positive future apart. And you've got divorce coaches there. 
it looks like it's quite a small team. It looks like it's quite intimate. You're building trust on either side. You're working with two people. You're trying to do it fairly. I don't know. In my head, it's just that's that that must be quite a difficult thing to scale to kind of keep that <laughs> that personal kind of service that obviously is going to be needed when people are going through quite a traumatic experience, and yet do the do the whole tech scale thing. Well, I, I think the the interesting thing with what we're doing is that. Um, from a customer perspective, you like to have a a single touch point. You like to have that trust that you talk about. But actually, the amount of kind of hours somebody needs to spend with someone, or even minutes, over the purpose of over the course of the divorce, is often not not massive. So mm. our divorce coaches can handle a lot of um, divorces simultaneously in in the same way as and and we can grow our team of divorce coaches as well and and that was one of the things that I think probably very relevant to touch on is that there are there are quite a lot of people who want to work in this way in terms of from the kind of supply side um and act as divorce coaches and help people go through this and and we actually off the back of uh, we were in the BBC fairly recently we got a huge amount of people saying I've got relevant skills. Can I come and work for you? Can I help right. do this? So, so then again, you're back into the kind of model where you are. You obviously have to make sure everyone is trained, has the right skills, etc. But you are effectively then making sure that there is um, that you grow your team of coaches in line with the kind of customer demand, and that model is very scalable both in the UK and potentially globally. So if you don't mind me asking, what what is next? Um, I suppose this is a period of reflection, this kind of working from home. <laughs> a lot of businesses are having a look at their business continuity. They're having a, I suppose they're kind of having a bit of internalization before they kind of he- head back out. Yeah. Um, it might even allow businesses to edit in a way that they hadn't been able to previously. Yeah. I, so every, everyone has to look at their business seriously at the moment and it would be ridiculous if any company was saying no we're we're flying apart from maybe tesco's <laughs> <laughs> but was, so yeah supermarkets fine but um any new startup will have or or kind of relatively uh early startup will have um things that they need to consider um and the funding landscape will change and, and everything will change um we believe our business model is is absolutely right for um the, what is going on in the world now and moving forward so I don't have any concerns in kind of the uh the kind of medium to long term about about amicable um mm. but I think there will be things we'll have to navigate for the next few months um working from home actually that's that's been incredibly easy because go wh- when we started um, this, one of the things we also looked at is the type of people who we thought could help our customers the most. And um, we have ended up, uh, and kind of intentionally, employing quite a lot of parents who were looking for flexible work, often because they didn't want to go back to city jobs because of kids, or they needed to do less hours, etc. And what we do lends itself very well to working in that way because customers book meetings directly in their coach's diary. So coaches can maintain their own diary. They can have a lot of control and anonymity around their uh, time. And we realized that we could recruit some brilliant people if we offered that flexibility. Uh, And so that's the model that we've set up. And that also Mm. meant there was always a degree of everybody was set up to be able to control their own hours and work from home and work in a certain way. So actually the switching to working from home from our perspective has been very, very straightforward. We, we had everyone, we were moving to Microsoft teams anyway. So we had everyone on teams within, I think about a day and a half and um, just switched our team meetings to be all uh, digital. So apart from a little bit of requirement to kind of check the post and do some printing, (laughs) the the general kind of move from that perspective has been been very straightforward and that again helps with the scalability and helps with our sort of ability to be moved forwards once kind of people's decision making has picked up um go back to your what's next though um one of the areas that we think really 
it is kind of hugely important to people and important to the the government and the court system, etc. It is parenting and how you effectively parent together. And we already do a lot of advice for people around co-parenting and setting up co-parenting for success. And that's mm. something that we're, we're building out some technology tools around that to try and make that process as as easy as possible for people to help them do it successfully uh, any couple that we keep out of court is a win from our perspective and and from theirs and from the kind of the court's perspective because it's a hugely painful process look i really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to speak to us so thank you for coming on the show and fingers crossed um homeworking continues to be something that's relatively straightforward and successful no problem really good to speak to you thank you I need to be careful how I phrase how much I love this company because it's one that I never want to use. If that sounds right, yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah, fair. yeah. Well, it's like you know, at the minute, um, I, I'd never realised. Just sorry, this is slightly off topic, but also on topic. Yeah, um, I'd never realised until I'd been at home so much how many um funeral app style things there are out there have you, have you ever seen any daytime tv it's obviously aimed at old people yeah. because it's all about dying and whatever else there's an app that i never really want to have a think about using um obviously uh that will come to a point whereas divorce might not um but yeah you're right it's, it's kind of it's, it's a useful product yeah. so we know that divorce rates in the uk are unfortunately on the rise a lot of relationships do break down uh and right now whilst whilst I was a bit glib about it at the beginning of the interview, there are a lot of people going through some, some difficult times at home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're lucky, you and I, Dave, uh, to have such wonderful partners in life that, that these 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 times that we spend under lockdown with them are, are a joy as opposed to, to anything else. Um, he says, knowing Rosie is just out of earshot. <laughs> so look, um, a couple of stats that, that Pip Wilson wanted me to mention. The average cost of divorce, including financial arrangements, is around £9,000. The total cost to the economy is estimated to be £51 billion a year. Okay, The source for that information is from the Relationships Foundation. Ten years ago, okay, it was around £37 billion a year. So that's what a £14 billion increase in the last 10 years. And that's a representation of the, f- the, the financial cost of failure in family and relationship lives as a nation in terms of all the various different knock-on effects that, that then are associated to the breakdown of, of, um, of marriages and relationships. So what Amicable are doing uh, is providing a service that might actually be lessen the burden on the economy and, and the public purse to a certain degree yeah yeah i mean i just think of whenever i hear the word divorce my mind goes to one place and one place only and that is ross from friends and i just think how he could have he could have navigated around one of his many divorces or or whatever using uh this app because as you as you say with those figures it's it's not getting cheaper it's not exactly going down in you know there's no trajectory tra- positive trajectory with divorces you know if there's one divorce a year it's still it's still a sad thing you know so i think anything that's going to help people a save money and b make it easier is it needs to be applauded and uh, uh, and held in high acclaim because as pip mentions you know it's not just the the monetary costs of a divorce it has like a draining impact on your life it takes up an mm. awful lot of time you've got to knock off work early to go to meet your divorce lawyer you've then got to get together as a group and you know add all these layers and facets to something that's already a horrible hard process if we're talking about removing all of that and you know boiling it down to much easier to digest virtual chats and sessions and clear progressions and timelines and stuff like that via the app that process becomes easier and less of a burden. You don't want the process to burden you because you're already going for a shit show anyway, right? I don't really understand why it hasn't been virtual up to this mm. point. Mm. And and I like Pip's point where she basically alludes to the fact that it can be, you know, it can be useful. Mm. You know, the the fact that tech can help you in a different place, be in a different place rather. You, you, you know, you're on a call, but you're not necessarily in front of each other. Given the circumstances, is a real benefit, mm. perhaps. Mm. Um, so it's odd that, that that it hasn't embraced technology to this point. Yeah, it's bizarre that it hasn't taken this long, but probably, I don't know. You know, you you're always looking for that spark, and 
you know, so many of the of, of the founder stories we have come from a great place. So many of them also come from bad places. I think of uh, Gillian's experience with uh, Safe in the City. You know, that's come yeah, from a bad yeah. experience. And it's the same with Pip's co-founder. You know, off the back of her expensive, lengthy divorce, she thought, well, something needs to be done about this. And, uh, you know, how how founders come up with their companies is is never short of amazing. But again, it's just another example of real life experience dictating a startup. What I do really kind of like about this is that they they have to be passionate. You know these people are passionate and care about this particular problem because it's, you know, it, they they uh, articulate that it is scalable and that, you know they are they are fixing a problem. But it, this is not a quick win, no. um, because of the length of time that it takes to go through divorce. Um, Pitt mentions anything from kind of. Uh, six months to a year, you know, they have to be purposefully slow themselves if they're going to get meaningful customer feedback about how what they're doing is working and whether or not it's helping couples. So it isn't like they can just rush a product out to market and, you know, the whole usual kind of uh, let's get some VC money in, let's get a product out, let's iterate. All of that has has to be a very different kind of mindset and approach here to make sure that they're actually building something that really helps. I mean, I just think of like how you measure the success of Amicable and uh, my mind goes to like the review section and like five out of five stars, the best divorce I've ever had. You know, <laughs> I don't think he's a prick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We didn't kill each other. Five stars. You know, I think, <laughs> but that, that must be high currency for Amicable, right? Feedback is, yeah, yeah. because how do you, you know, you're not really selling anything. It's hard to measure stuff like this. So I guess, and I don't know, unless we unless we start to see a dramatic reduction in in, in divorces, um, I suppose Amicable will always do well, well, hopefully always do well. Yeah, look, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, mm. it is something that is going to happen in society. Mm. And if, if it can be made to be uh, more neutral, more balanced, less friction, easier... Uh, and and let's not forget that often there are families, not just children, but lots of friends and families are torn apart by this and it's a difficult time. So anything that allows people to retain the bond, because, you know, whenever whenever a relationship breaks up, there's there's always that kind of thought of, well, you know, there there are reasons that people got together in the first place. Mm-hmm. And at it, its very core, hopefully that some of those kind of some of those foundations of a relationship can be preserved and and other stuff that, you know, especially where kids are involved can be built on moving forward so that, that there is a, a functioning relationship of a sort for those children. And that's the most important for kids. You know, my parents separated when I was two, so I know no difference, but I, I knew they didn't necessarily get on. And the older I got, the more I realized that. But as a child, I didn't have a clue. They were amicable. Mm. <laughs> they were, you know, they, 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 they agreed with each other about me, whether they, didn't want to or not you know so i was very lucky in that regard but you know separations can ruin families and ruin relationships and you know the the worst thing that can happen in situations like that is you know the parents turning on each other and using the child as you know a negotiation tool or whatever which is just and a a messy divorce is going to make that more likely exactly and as pip mentions bringing in lawyers you know even though they're there to help you they probably want more money and they also want to get you the best deal now you might in your own mind think well okay it's only fair for us to have joint custody the lawyer's not going to think that the lawyer's going to be like you deserve full custody you know and it's just uh, well the lawyer is there to make money for the firm as well exactly exactly so I just think this takes away any kind of bias of it almost, I guess, you know, any kind of lawyer bias or, or stuff like that to try and solve the root issue. Don't outsource communication. Don't outsource communication. Exactly. Yes. Very wise words. Right. Uh, We will go to our advert break. When we come back, we are going to be talking about social distancing. Once a month, Tech Talks opens The Tuck Shop, a YouTube tech news roundup, which is kindly carried by Disruptive Live. Disruptive Live is the UK's first and only 24-7 TV channel for the technology industry. Stay up to date with all the latest industry news by following our regular talk shows broadcast live across the Disruptive Live website and social media channels. You can also catch Disruptive Live at some of the largest global technology events, broadcasting from London, Manchester, Singapore, Dubai, and many more. 
Right. Some time ago on the show, I can't remember how long ago now, we talked about Starship Technologies, and I'm pretty sure it's because we went to something like Unbound and Starship Technologies were there. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we saw Starship Technologies in the flesh. Or it might have been that Ryder took a video of them at at Web Summit. But we we spoke about Starship Technologies. There is a report in The Guardian today, robots deliver food in Milton Keynes under coronavirus lockdown. Starship Technologies, small vehicles navigate pavements uh, pavements, with no human driver required. I think this is great because uh, I've only had one takeout uh, during lockdown. You look shocked, Jack. One, I mean, I've, we've been good. We started off probably at one a week and we didn't for about two or three weeks and then we did last night. So what, what was your one takeout? What's... Uh, so there's an Italian at the bottom uh, of uh, St. Margaret's um, that's never been on, on delivery or anything. Right. It's kind of quite a small business. It's very popular locally. It's always busy. Um, but obviously, they're going to be struggling during yeah. this time and they have gone on delivery. Uh, with a limited menu so we were like you know what yeah we'll support we'll support uh del posto shout out for del posto great little restaurant um so we did that yep but of course at the same time um whilst it's talking about food deliveries here uh i have had numerous things delivered through the post that we've done from an online shopping point of view Mm -hmm. and there is that slight guilt of like should i be doing this because like someone comes and drops the, the package on your doorstep but like I'm not washing. Are you washing down stuff before you? You are. You well, see, no, I'm no, not. no, not washing down boxes stuff, and but the packaging. Minute, so what? What we'll do is we will break down the boxes, put them straight into the recycling, and then wash our hands. That's probably should be wiping down more stuff, but um, that's that's what we've done. Yeah, because like yourself, I've I've had to. I, I ordered a load of new uh, exercise equipment because that's the only thing we're allowed to do these days, right? So. <laughs> Uh, they can't. We're, we're really lucky, actually. We have a porch, so you could they can open the door, leave it in the porch, and then leave, and then we like wipe down the handle for the next person or whatever. But that's that's as that's as extreme as we're getting with it, I think. I mean, my brother-in-law when they when they do a um, a waitro shop, they wipe down the packaging on all of the food. Wow. I mean, well, I don't do that. No, I we, we've done it once, and that was because when we were in the queue at the supermarket, the person a couple of feet behind us was coughing. Uh, so we did with that lot, uh, and I think we both got in and showered as well immediately. But no, I haven't done it to that degree. Well, anyway, so Starship. Um, Star, I was going to say Starship Enterprises. Nah. Starship Technologies. Terrible, isn't it? <laughs> Starship Technologies. Robot delivery service in Milton Keynes could prove to be the future of lockdown Britain as miniature autonomous vehicles bring food deliveries to almost 200,000 residents in town. The autonomous delivery startup uh, created in 2014 by two Skype co-founders has been testing its beer cooler sized robots in public since 2015 the small white six-wheeled vehicles trundle along pavements to bring small deliveries to residents and workers in the neighborhoods which they operate without the need for human driver or delivery person it's the first commercial deployment in the uk i think it's 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 a good use of tech um if it keeps people safe i don't want it to to put frontline key workers out of business obviously delivery drivers whatever else but i'm sure it won't because we're talking about food deliveries in quite localized areas or whatnot but if, if it's if it's if it's anything that keeps people safe and uh, allows people to stay home and keep distance it's a good thing right yep yep and these 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 little i don't know what you call it like a transportation box or whatever they're 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 oddly cute for something that's just like a box on six wheels but they're also like they look they look like they should be in red dwarf or wally red dwarf. Uh, uh, yeah one of those oh yeah, yeah. wally's probably better. Yeah, yeah yeah but um they they're incre- from what i can remember reading about them before they're incredibly robust like it's not like hiring a boris bike and then taking the wheel off and selling it for crack or whatever these things are like legit impossible to penetrate unless you have the means to get in there um, via the app or whatever but a it's the future of tech being amazing again and b it's like you say it's alleviating some of the shorter delivery risks that people might encounter like you said i don't think this is going to take over delivery or uber or or you know anything like that but where tech can help it should and this is definitely an example of that and the other great thing about it of course is it's less cars on the road exactly exactly how nice is it at the moment by the way like oh just the like the night sky is clearer the 
the air we're breathing is nicer. You know, I I went for a run the other day and there was they, they just mowed the grass on the green or whatever. And I was like, I've never had that experience in London to be able to breathe in freshly cut grass and feel nice about it. You know, mm-hmm. usually like, oh, I've got like half a bit of diesel in there and some petrol and oh, there's some NOS canisters coming into my inhalation as well. But now it's like oh, man, yeah, yeah. just fresh cut grass and good shit. No, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, obviously, we live <laughs> we live under the Heathrow flight pass, so it's been like, oh, yes. no planes. I can hear birds. But anyway, That's crazy. There go. Yeah, of course. Well, look, Jack, thank you for taking the time to join me on today's call. Uh, Pip, thank you for being our guest. We will be back next week. Thank you.